is this the first time we've talked in 30 years? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think we may have talked like right afterwards yeah. um, for a little bit, but it, it, it's probably, you know, 30 years. Of course, back then it wasn't as easy just to, you know, drop somebody a line, you know what I mean? You had to actually yeah, call them at their house, you know what I mean? So it's a little more, you know, different. Yeah. But. Yeah. You know, the last person that actually called me that was an artist was Fred Durst. And he left me such a great message on my machine that I kept it. It was like uh, 2014 or 15. And he goes, Fred Durst doing the old school phone call, you know? And it was so Fred Durst awesome that I was like, I got to save this message forever, you know? That's so awesome. Probably the last phone call I've ever gotten, I think, from an artist or, you know, IVs. I see you haven't gotten rid of them. No, and actually the old one's not even back there. Um, the, really? old, the old one's in the house, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I still like V's. Yeah, well, I noticed from the pictures, I actually kind of forgot. But, you know, with looking at these pictures, I was like, oh, yeah, I used to play that white flying V. And, you know, oh. the story was, too, that I, I can't remember what happened. Um, but for some reason, when we were down there, we had to borrow, um, was his name Christy Crash? That's right, from Pretty Boy Floyd. Pretty Boy Floyd, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't remember if that was his his name. <laughs> yeah, probably Christy not. Crash really. Majors. Yeah, huh. but but he had a V just like mine. There's something wrong with mine. I don't know if that's the V in the picture or not. I didn't look that closely, but we had to borrow his V. And I remember you driving us there, and it was like um, it was almost like a flop house or something. It was like they lived yeah. in some warehouse and they were all there was just these mattresses laying around. <laughs> and he he handed yeah. us the guitar and we used we used that guitar on on most of the record. I think mine might have been broken or something. I, I can't remember. What yeah, I do remember that. I think I was just about to produce them or produce them. Or I I, I don't remember the order. That's I think right. you, I think you produced them first. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And Bang Tango, which, by the way, I mean, I was a big fan of Bang Tango. They had some great songs, and the sounds on that record were phenomenal. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I really like it. Uh, I divide my career into, like, three parts. Like, that was the first part, was you guys and Bang Tango and Pretty Boy Floyd and all those hair bands, Child's Play, and, I don't know, King of the Hill, and, you know, all those bands that got signed. And then there was, like, the middle part where I did Motorhead Records, and that's pretty much... All I did was like four Motorhead records and I worked at uh, Giant Records. And then this this part, which is like POD on, which is kind of like where I started having hit records. Yeah. So yeah. like, but I would never have gotten there without the first part. <laughs> the first part taught me a lot, you know, so. Yeah, you know, I was amazed. I mean, cause I'm kind of in and out of, you know, the music business sometimes. I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't involved that much for quite a while. And when I looked up your, uh, all the albums you've done, you've done like over 150 albums and I was blown away by some of the people you've done. It was amazing. I was just like, holy shit, this guy's got it going on. So it took a while. Yeah. Wow. It took me from when I worked on you guys, I think it was 1989. Was it something like that? Was that Enter the Mirror Black? What year was that? Yeah, it was 89 and we released it in February of 1990. Right. So from then until 1999, I sold like no records. Like enough, not enough to really pay the bills, uh, sort of going like hand to mouth, working in record companies, just learning the business, you know, from the other side, actually, which was the Pfeiffer side, actually. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, you know, educational, actually, and kind of useful. And then uh, I kind of got, you know, I think what changed my career was the computer, actually, getting into computer recording, using Pro Tools on Sepultura record. And um, that wasn't really used in rock music very much at that point so uh, i started using it for like uh less than jake and stuff and then i had a really big hit in 1999 with pod with um their first album and from then on i think i've sold about 45 million albums but up until then i sold none it was like this drought that i yeah. kept thinking i'd done something wrong to somebody in another record business in a parallel universe you know <laughs> like like maybe i produced the sanctuary record and i cursed you know <laughs> made the pentagram with uh, whirl and that was the end of that you know <laughs> no I, I remember hearing that interview and i was like oh, god i don't remember that but it oh, sounds man. like something he would do because you know what he you know what he does it's like 
I'm not always around when he's singing because he doesn't always like people around. It's right. always dark and he's usually naked. <laughs> so, oh, so yeah. you know, he either has to be hidden away or something, but there's always some kind of candle burning or, or something in the background. So it sounds like total oral. Yeah. Well, Sound City was big enough that we could put the candles out and not worry about it burning down. You know, that we was all, and I think that studio, a few studios, believe it or not, like five or six years later, burned down from candles that were be, that were left on the uh oh the really spots. yeah some big studios actually so it's yeah. a good thing we uh blew the candles out i guess so you know i i didn't realize when we were down at sound city what the legacy was there you know i i'm sure yeah. i'm probably in my own world you know and and doing doing whatever but i just i remember the studio being kind of you know I mean, they turned out great records, obviously, as, right. as I found out later. But it seemed like there was always some kind of weird technical difficulty, and there was some like some always I some agree. weird voodoo. I completely agree. I think that Grohl's documentary was so full of shit that I watched this documentary. That's why Keith Olsen left and moved next door. I actually came up to the studio next door. That's the guy who mentored me was Keith Olsen, the guy who built Sound City, but he left because there was no maintenance. So he moved and built his own studio called Good Night, L good Night LA. And I'm watching this whole thing with these guys and I'm going, you know, they made some good records in there, but it's not like friggin' Sunset Sound right. or the record plant or, you know, like, or Capital Recording. It was fucking Sound City. It was it, like, it was a dump. It was very underwhelming. I mean, yeah. that, I remember that. I remember feeling like, okay, well, you know, I, I get it, you know, this is where we record, you know what I mean? But when you look back and you're like, Rumors was recorded here and Tom Petty did all his shit here and all these, I'm like, really? At that studio? Yeah, yeah. I, that's, that's stretching it. I mean, some of it was done there. A lot was done at the Village Record. I mean, if you read the credits, come on. I mean, you know, you know, I think Nirvana was done there and I think that's why Grohl has a big thing with that studio in that console and i actually have that same console in my studio i have a smaller version of it and it is a great console but the one thing i kind of like annoyed me about that because being a producer and, and having that be so important at one point in my career was the sound of everything yeah. nobody talked about the material or the songs or the songwriting or any none of that came up in that documentary at all and i'm like hey guys if you hadn't written smells like teen spirit it, I don't care what you recorded that thing on. You know, you could record it, Smells Like Teen Spirit, on a cassette player, and that would have been huge. Yeah. So, like, yeah. let's not overstate this, you know. It, it leads people to believe that the recording console was some magic record. Uh, no, it wasn't. And it's only been proven out in the last 10 years where nobody has recording consoles, mainly, right? Just a couple guys like me who just like looking at them. But essentially, you don't need them, you know. I mean... I don't know any kids that have consoles, anybody making records, like rarely, you know. Yeah, well, not not anymore. I mean, of course, back then, you know, but I mean, I'm sure there's probably some tonal quality that it must be preamps or something, but can't you pretty much get all that now? You know? Yeah, and again, I think that I spent the first 15 years of my career worried about that stuff. And then only when I wasn't having hits, I mean, I was literally trying everything like, Guitar sounds, drum sounds, bass sounds, all the stuff, you know, using the best tape machines, all, nothing happened. And then I realized, you know what? My wife was a publisher, by the way, so it was good to have a songwriting person around. She goes, Howard, you spend too much time on this other stuff. You need to have, have better material, better songs and great singers, and the rest of it will work out. And I remember thinking, I know that already, but I'm not practicing that enough. So with Bang Tang, I remember with um, POD, I started really focusing on the material only, like just making sure I didn't care, like, we could have recorded that in a dungeon, but it's like, as long as those songs were strong and then I like kind of hit them out of the park after that, I started worrying. I started hiring people to do all that for me. I don't, I didn't like, I had a team of guys who set up guitars and drums and like when we worked together, it was just me and I think an engineer, you know, and if the engineer wasn't good, we were kind of fucked, you know, right. nowadays you got like a drum editor, a guitar guy, a guitar tech, a drum tech, an editor, an engineer, uh, an assistant, there's all kinds of people involved, you know? Yeah. So, you know, if you have money, <laughs> you know, um, we recorded we recorded our last record right here. And, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily the greatest sounding record in the world. Yeah. It was it was a good 
record for us. It was a good comeback back record, and we did it right here in this room. Of course, not the drums. We we you know we went to a decent studio for the drums, and they just tracked everything right here. And I mean, that's the way we managed to do it with our. Who sang for you? Who was the singer? Warl. Oh, so Warl was still alive. Yeah, it was. It was. This was in 2014. Oh, okay. And How did he that, pass away? What happened to Warl? He, he passed away in 2017. What was the cause of death? He was well, a heart attack. You know, but I mean, he was in Brazil, so I mean. I'm not really sure of all of the details. He was in Brazil recording um, a solo record, and he had a he had a band down there. It was kind of like a backing band for him, and um, they did like a lot of Nevermore stuff, you know. And they would just kind of tour and do Nevermore uh, songs and everything because Nevermore was no longer a band, and right. um, they just decided to record a record. So he went down there. But Whirl, I don't know if you know anything about Whirl, but Whirl was in pretty bad shape. Um, toward the end and I mean he was he was to the point where I mean he was drinking a lot and sometimes it, it it he would kind of back off a bit but I think when he wasn't around people that were really really close to him and you know I don't know about his other band they, they were probably close to him too but we've all known him for 30 plus years so we kind of knew what was going on and and I think when he was out of our sight he was different oral. He was, he was okay. Well now, now I can just go full steam. And now I'm not saying that that caused anything, but you know, it probably didn't help. And um, they say he had a heart attack um, and, you know, he was stuck down there for quite a while. Oh um, wow! So eventually we got him home. Oh, wow. That's terrible. I, he was the sweetest guy. That's all I remember. From yeah. You know, it's funny because a lot of people think of him as like this, dark you know deep intense lyric it writing monster and he was like the sweetest guy actually i mean he could be a dick sometimes but really right. in in you know in reality he was just a sweetheart and just the nicest kind of like goofiest kind of funny dorky guy he wasn't this like you know menacing you know mean singer or anything it was oh. It's just completely different, different than his persona, really. What so. happened with you guys? Are you still together? Were you when you made that record in 2014? Was it the same band? Yeah, everybody but Sean. You know, um, Sean. Sean left in. Uh, he left right after Mirror Black came out. Um, really? I we, did, we did a tour. We did a video on the tour and all that, and then he just kind of decided it wasn't his thing. I, I always felt like. Um, he was not very comfortable. Um, yeah. It just wasn't his thing, you know what I mean? We we were all loving it, you know, um, you know, getting to be, you know, semi rock stars for a while, but that was just not his idea of fun. <laughs> so I think, you know, eventually that it just got to the point where he was like, you know, why am I doing this? It's not really my thing. And um, he ended up um, kind of doing some producing and stuff, you know, and making his own music. It was very unique. It wasn't, um, you know, uh, po popular, I guess you would say. I mean, of course, we weren't really pop music kind of people, but his was really avant-garde and he loved it that way. And he was really good at that kind of stuff. It's just like, I just don't think a lot of people, it wouldn't be acceptable for the masses. Most people would be like, oh, you know, uh, but not, not that it, that's bad. The, every time I would go see that guy and listen to to some of his stuff, I always learned something from him, and and it was always very interesting, and I was always very blown away by how did you do that? How did you get that sound? How did you? He was the guy who lived in a little apartment. He had a huge mixing console in there, and he had all this other junk that I thought was just crap, but he could make the greatest tones out of it. And I always thought that was so cool that somebody could just pull all this great tone out of junk. He was yeah. he had that gift, you know, so yeah, it was an interesting part of that process. He was the hardest part of the process, I think. More than yeah. Everybody yeah. Else. I remember some really unfortunate things that happened. And I mean, you know, I, I mean, if we've never apologized for some of that, I'm doing it right now because oh, I don't I do. You guys are like on a one to ten, a two compared to Motorhead. Yeah. I mean, come on. You know, oh, really? I did four Motorhead records. Yeah. I ended up uh, in the hospital. Oh, know, Jesus. You know, from exhaustion. So, you know, that was like working with a 
in total insane madman. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, some, a lot of bands I've done, it's weird. Like, uh, when my career started to take off, I started getting bigger and bigger artists to produce, but you know, with that, you get egos and there's, you know, a lot of, uh, you're always got a gun to your head, you know, like by the record company to perform. Sure. Oh, you know, like you, they didn't hire you to, you know, have fun. They would want to make you to make money, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you guys were actually a really good, uh, all those bands from that era it was like, I learned that you can't react overreact to artists sometimes like you know like i remember when you guys were getting guitar sounds i was so frustrated because i couldn't get them i didn't know how to get them you know and yet i never thought about asking you know for help from other people nowadays i would just be like hey i don't let's get someone to help us you know like it's immediately delegate 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 because there's you're not your focus again has to be on the songs, you know, on the material. So if you start getting in the weeds, but I was in the weeds a lot back then. And so not, and not knowing your kind of music, cause I wasn't really that, like I was, it's funny when I looked at your pictures right before you guys are in the at photo albums of me with Al McKay from Earth, Wind and Fire. And I was like, kind of coming right out of doing R and B music and pop music. And like, I think I did like Bang Tango to me was like a, was a project that was a outlier. Like that wasn't something I really wanted to do. I wanted to be in the pop music world. So the rock thing just took its own, it dragged me along for the ride, you know, and I haven't gotten off yet. So, you know, I didn't really think that, but you know, I, I just wasn't as familiar with Dave Mustaine or Megadeth. And, you know, like I remember going over to Metal, Metal, uh, Metal Blade Records and talking to Mike Failey and Brian Slagle. And I was like looking at all these, you know, Lizzie Borden and all these bands. And I was like, I never heard any of this shit. Okay. So I, was, I felt completely like a fish out of water on that, on your album. Like I was like, and Pfeiffer was just, he, I think what he really wanted was hit songs. So when he heard future tense and into the mirror black, they looked like songs to him, right? Yeah. They were verse chorus, you know, they had like an arrangement. Right. Yeah. And, and so he was like, well, and I remember we did those in Seattle, if I can remember correctly in a little studio. Yeah. In Seattle. Yeah. You remember, so you remember what happened was you, we, we were playing a show up there and, and I guess Viper wanted to come up there. You guys actually came up there. You came up there with Bob and we were at the oh, show I remember that. and you, you, we, I went out to the car. I, there was like a rental car or something and you wanted me to play some of our songs. And I remember playing Epitaph, which was kind of a, it was a bit of a mess of a song. Yeah. So you turned and you looked at me and you said, can you like hum, hum the, you know, how the lyric goes and, you know, tell me how the lyrics go and everything and, and sing the chorus. And I'm like, no, dude, I, I can't, I don't even know. I don't even know what that is. And you just kind of <laughs> looked at me like, who the fuck are these guys? Yeah. And that's probably the me. Time, you know, it was kind of a deal where, you know, but it sounded to me like Bob was bringing you in to, you know, kind of save the day. And that's kind of what it was, you know? It was. Yeah. Yeah. Because you weren't Bob signing, I don't believe. You were the signing of somebody else, right? Bob, the other Bob, right? Wasn't there another Yeah, Bob? I'm trying to remember. I know uh, Don Grierson was involved at one point. And, um, right. I forgot a lot of those people's names. Well, Pfeiffer was like a, um, he ended up, from what I heard, not on the right side of the law. Actually. I remember seeing some some TV show where they were talking about it. Yeah, he, he was always a little... Um, I don't know. I think he was in a band at one point. Like he was, he came from a band, so they hired him at Columbia, and they uh, sort of made him an A and R guy. They really didn't have the qualifications to be an A and R guy, you know. So he got this job, and I think that he started getting assigned bands. And he did have a big hit though with with Alice Cooper. I mean, that was his thing. Poison was his, you know. So I think that was the end of it, though. That was it for him, you know. But that kind of carries you for a few years in A and R. That one, right. So, uh, but yeah, I remember being in that studio by the sound and there was a big fucking dead rat. That's all I can remember. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. On the console, it, like, it was the grossest was, thing I ever saw. Like, yeah, it was called Star Trek Studios. Okay. And they were me. in, they were in the process of building it. And so there was just some, just like a lot of stuff that, you know, construction stuff that was just kind of left open there and everything. And yeah, I remember that. That was crazy. Yeah. And you guys rehearsed in a parking garage. 
Yep, and it was a few floors underground, and uh, you would roll into the front door that we had these two giant doors, and people would shit and piss all around the front door. It was like homeless people would just come down there. We'd find them like passed out in front of our in front of our door, and they would just use it as their toilet. So all the time, sounds like nothing's changed in Seattle, huh? (laughs) No, well, actually, yeah, it's probably gotten a little bit worse at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I went to that parking garage, I was like, wow, this is like, like, is this the way it is in the rock business? Like, you know, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> so, yeah, there was, I mean, that place was a little bit rough, but you know what? It was a really good deal. That's probably why but yeah. I mean, we had that room for like 10 years. It was 150 bucks a month. And we, I just, I kept it even after the band was gone. I kept it for like five years because I mean that you just, you can't beat that. And it was kind of like a storage area, right? In the park. Yeah, like sort of. Yeah. I just remember it was uh, strange. I don't remember going out with Bob, though. That's an interesting one. Yeah, I, you guys I, came up and saw us. It was it was weird because I think you wanted to hear what was going on. And then, you know, they ended up um, sending you back. And we did the demo. And, uh, and the demo we did was Future Tense, Mirror Black, and a song called um, I'm Insane. And that was kind of a leftover track from uh, uh, Refuge Denied, but it never made it on Refuge Denied either. So we oh. kind of retooled it a little bit and um, and they ended up really liking it. And uh, so I, I yeah. mean, it was cool. It worked for what, what we planned on doing. And then do you remember Whirl and I came down to your place as well and we wrote two more songs down there because we were shy about two songs. And so we were kind of stuck and um, we decided to come on down and um, we were in your studio. You kind of had like a little like garage type, like thing. Oh my God, you guys were there. I was still living. Yeah. Was it Reseda or something? There was a little studio there. Yeah. Tiny little place. Yeah. And and you, you tapped out all the beats on, I think it was a Lindrum or something. Right, right. Yeah, I don't remember that, but that's what we would have done. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and we that's how we finished those two songs. And, you know, I'll never forget the uh, the trip down there. Whirl and I stayed in a, a hotel room. And one night after we were done at your place, I was really upset about one of the, one of those songs, the way it was going. And we got back to the hotel and we started drinking pretty heavy. We had this giant bucket of popcorn. I don't know where we got it. It was huge. And we're sitting there and we're eating this popcorn and we're drinking and we were drinking like vodka or something. And we, after a while, we started to get a little shitty and we <laughs> actually got in a fist fight with that popcorn and the popcorn's flying all over this freaking hotel room. And I mean, I'm surprised they didn't throw us out and we had to sleep, you know, there's two beds in this hotel room. We had to, you know, sleep there. Eventually we just like, fuck it, you know, we'll stop fighting and we'd go to sleep. So did you guys yeah, get out there? Get that. Did you stay there and the band came down? Was that what happened or how did No, it was just it was just you and you and I and Whirl. Oh, okay. Then yeah. how long was it from when we made that to the record? Was it like uh I think it was uh, I think it was like a month or two before. Oh, okay. So it was It's almost year. like a Yeah, cuz then you came up too and you did uh some pre-production with us too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see that's funny. I don't remember going there. It's it's such a blur. It's so weird. <laughs> 